Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. You are tuned into our Lesson and Critique series with Sony Artisan of Imagery, Tony Gale. And today we're going to be talking about experimenting with photography. So for those of you who have not caught up on this series, two-part series, Tony is going to be teaching a lesson on a given topic. And then the next part, he's going to be critiquing your submissions. So it does require you guys to get involved. Last time we did some off-camera flash photography today. It's a little broader, Tony. So hopefully we get more people involved, right? I I believe in everybody watching. I have nothing but confidence in, in all of them. Plus, you could submit. There we go. We Look, I think I'm going to get the whole team on board to submit. And all of you out there watching, yeah, let's keep the positive vibes going. Everybody get out there, experiment. And uh, let's see what Tony has for us today. Tony, I'm going to kick it over to you. And I'll see you in a little bit for some Q&A. Sounds good. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony Artist in Revenue And today we're going to be doing, as Derek said, the Lesson and Critique series, Experimenting with Photography. Uh, as many of you probably know, in addition to being a Sony artisan of imagery, I'm also a BenQ ambassador, a Manfredo ambassador in x right Colorado. And I do want to thank the B&H event space and Sony for having me because without them, right now, nothing's on and you'd be doing something else. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm a commercial people and portrait photographer based in New York City. Uh, I shoot a variety of people and portraits for editorial corporate and advertising clients. Uh, coming up. The last thing with me until we come up with some more ideas, and if you have some ideas that you'd like to hear me talk about, please let me know, uh, is next week, 3 p.m. on the 17th, we're going to be doing a critique of the pictures that you submit, as Derek said. But don't worry, there's still plenty of cool things. There's a whole bunch of Sony-sponsored events at the B&H event space, some stuff with Scott Robert Lim. Andrew Geraci, Thibault Roland, Mahesh Thepa, Autumn Schrock, Jess Santos, a whole lot of stuff. Uh, it's all available. You can register on the b &H event space. A lot of very cool topics. I encourage you to take a look. The price is certainly right. It's hard to be free. And I always mention alphauniverse.com, a great place to take a look and see what is happening with Sony and photography. Even if you don't shoot Sony cameras, there's still a lot of great information there and a lot of things that can be inspiring. And when I took the screenshot this morning, I see that apparently uh, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, Next Generation Creativity on the Go gets announced. No, that's not tomorrow. The 12th. Today's the 10th. So Wednesday, I guess. But regardless, it looks like something's happening. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's cool. Oh, you know what? Now this date makes more sense. Uh, also, on Wednesday, there's an Alpha Community event in San Francisco. It's free to register if you're in the Bay Area or if you want to travel there. Uh, all that information is on alphauniverse.com. There's also the Alpha Universe Forums, a very uh, good, friendly, inviting space. The Alpha Female, the Sony Alpha Female Facebook group where every week there is a $500 micro grant. I mentioned this just about every talk I do. You do not need to be female or identify as female to enter. Anyone can enter. Um, it's also a very friendly, inviting group. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look it's on Facebook. You can see what the micro grant topics are. They change every week. The current one is National Parks. They just announced it today. And... Uh, Alpha Universe or b &H is a great place to see when stuff is on sale. So I noticed today the Sony Alpha 7 R4, great camera, is $200 off. The Alpha 7 IV, $100 off. If you're looking, they're, good. they're both good cameras. All right. So we are in an exciting time to be a photographer. I, I always mention that or I almost always mention it. And part of the reason, especially with experimentation, is you can see something try something, have an idea, see if it works. If it doesn't, you can either say, well, that didn't work. It's not going to, or you know what? I bet it would work if I just did this or that and then try it again and then try it again and do all that much more quickly than when we were shooting with film. You know, with film, if you wanted to experiment, you'd shoot a roll of film, take it to the lab. If you were in a city with a good pro lab, wait three or four hours, maybe a day if it was contact sheets, Look at the pictures, say, oh, well, none of that worked. Shoot another roll of film, do the same thing, 
and keep doing trial and error until it worked, until you found something that worked or you gave up. Now we take a picture, did it work or not? Move right along. It's so much easier to experiment and try new things. So lesson and critique, experimenting with photography. For those of you who are going to submit, which I hope is everybody watching, plus Derek and the B&H event space team, uh, please submit no more than three images, at least 1,200 pixels on the short side, no more than 3,000 pixels on the long side. Um, although I guess if you have some crazy panoramic, it wouldn't fit that. Two event space reviews at Gmail. They are going to review the submissions to make sure that they're PG because we're, you know, this is a family thing. There's people of all ages. Uh, and then they will pass them along to me and I'll talk about them. If there's too many, we may not get to them all, uh, but I encourage you to submit. It would be great if we had so many that we couldn't see them all. All right, experimenting with photography. Um, part of the reason that we're starting with this is because it's easy, I think, as you get more experienced with photography to forget to experiment and to play. You know, with photography, there are many ways to do everything. Um, different people have different ideas. With experimenting in particular, there are going to be people who feel very, very, very strongly that one way of doing some particular technique is the right way and everybody else is wrong. Uh, I think if you get something that you like, then you did it right. And if you didn't get something you right, liked, then maybe try a different way. Uh, but there's no one right way to do anything. With film, when I started out, there were a limited number of ways that people would experiment. So cross-processing, where you would take negative film and process it as slide film, or slide film and process it as negative film, and you'd get these crazy color casts and sometimes hypersaturation. This was Ilford XP2 cross-processed, which was a C41 process black and white film. So it was processed in color chemistry, but it was a black and white film. I remember taking a roll of that to the lab and asking them to cross process it. And it was crazy. They'd never heard of anything like it. I'm sure I'm not the only person who did it. But at that time, at that lab, IBC right in Seattle, uh, I was the first person they'd ever seen do it. Um, so instead of having a black and white, but processing color negative film, you had a black and white-ish, more of a greenish, bluish and white uh, slide film. There was stuff like Kodak's Ectographic HC slide film. It wasn't supposed to be for portraits. There were things like solarization. But then there were things that you can do now. So in all of this, all of these cool effects that I did in the past and I thought were so fun, 20 years ago. Um, I think those are all probably at least 20 years old. Uh, these might be a little less. Um, all of those now with digital, if you want that effect, you can just do it. It's not that hard to recreate those effects uh, with digital, with Photoshop or what, what have you. You lose some of the serendipity. And I think part of what makes experimentation cool is the serendipity is what am I going to get? I'm not sure. And you get those happy accidents when you control things too much. Well, then it's not experimentation. Um, but you get into things, camera movement, Holga stuff. You get into different things that do translate well to digital. Um, part of what reminded me to experiment is during COVID. This was early COVID. I had to take a, a self-portrait for something. I don't remember what. And after that, for 80-something days until New York City allowed photog commercial photographers to work again, I did self-portrait every day. And because of that, I was trying to experiment and do different things because I didn't want to take the same picture every day. And it reminded me, it's important to experiment. It's important to try different things. It, Like I said before, it's easy to be like, this is the right way to do this, or this is the way I do this, and just do it that way because you know it works. Um, but especially if you're shooting for yourself, just play. Sometimes it won't work. Sometimes it will. So I'm going to go over some of the things I think are worth trying. Um, this is by no means every way you can experiment, of course, because 
essentially that's infinite, right? You, some of you may have amazing ideas for experimentation that have never occurred to me. I have a huge list of stuff I haven't gotten around to trying. For example, I've bought uh, lenses, just the lens elements, and now I need to find some black PCBC tube and see if I can make homemade lenses for the camera. Um, but I haven't found the right length. It, like, There's a lot of stuff I'm trying that I just haven't gotten around to finishing. Uh, so I'm excited to see what uh, everybody watching submits. So one of the easiest ways to start around with experimenting is exposure. So there's your standard exposure, the correct exposure. Sometimes going much darker or much brighter is much more interesting. So this was a picture I shot many years ago of the actor Terrence Stamp at an event. I'd gotten permission to photograph, but I had no control over anything. The lighting was terrible. Um, I just wanted to photograph Terrence Stamp because I thought it was cool. I'd just seen The Lion Me, which is a great film. Um, and everything was boring. Like it just wasn't an interesting place to photograph. I'm not really a journalist. Like event photos don't interest me uh, unless it's an event I'm involved with, of course, right? If it's your event, everybody's excited to see the pictures from their birthday or their mom's birthday or whatever. So what made this picture interesting to me was making it very, very overexposed. And all of a sudden, everything, the background went away. The lighting being not great became almost an asset because his eyes really pop, just overexposing. Here's an example of just standard exposure, beach in California, way overexposed. Now it starts to feel magical almost, like it's some sort of ethereal space or going way darker. And now you see that little bit of sky through the clouds and it feels ominous just standard exposure of some trees, exciting picture, no. Starts to get a little more interesting, way overexposed. Way underexposed, I like it a lot. So boring, mm -hmm. less boring, but much more interesting. All taken one after another. But this one, for me, is much more interesting. Now, it may or may not be to any one of you or anybody in particular, and that's fine. Uh, when people ask me which picture is the best, you know, it's subjective, right? Everything's subjective. But that's what I think. So here, overexposing completely changes the mood. Standard exposure, just boring overhead lighting. Now you underexpose, lower the chin a little. Now it feels very ominous. It feels like I'm the villain in a movie poster. Overexposing here, I don't think it's that interesting. Terrence Stamp looked great overexposed. Me, not so much. Uh, and sometimes even in a lighting and exposure I like, like this uh, actress I photographed a, few, a month or two ago. I, I'm happy with that lighting on the left. I think it looks good. I started experimenting with doing different things with overexposure. The overexposure, that first one, uh, second from the left, doesn't look good. I didn't, you know, boosted it. The saturation gets weird. It just doesn't look good. I desaturated a little bit more, went full black and white. And then all of a sudden in full black and white, I like it. Sometimes the abstractness that black and white can lend uh, really helps. So same exposure, these three overexposed ones, uh, which is just boosted in uh, raw processing. Um, but the black and white works. The other two, I don't think work at all. But again, that's the importance of experimentation, right? If, if you know something's going to work, you're not experimenting. You're just doing what you know will work. We also have things like white balance and color. In motion pictures and film, you see people working with color grading a lot. I think for some reason it often works better in movies than in still photos, but it just depends on the photo. You know, you have movies like Traffic uh, came out in, I don't know, mid 2000s, where there's three different stories. Each of them has a distinct color palette and a distinct color cast. 
you do see that a lot in film. You see it less often in photography. And sometimes in photography, when you see it, it just feels wrong, but not always. So here we have a neutral color balance, a little bit blue, a lot blue. Now it starts to feel like there's a mood, right? This, eh, not an exciting picture. This is a more interesting picture to me because of that blue. It's also something they do in motion pictures when they do day for night, when they shoot during the day and they want it to feel like nighttime, they just make everything blue. A little bit more blue. I think here we're going a little too far. A little warmer, not interesting. Too far. So an easy thing to try, if you, especially if you're shooting raw, is when you're processing, just cycle through the, the canned white balance settings and see if there's something you like. I mean, I think it's important to always make sure that you have a way to get the correct, correct neutral white balance. Uh, but sometimes just experimenting it in processing can do a lot. These I did all on camera, just changing the white balance, but you can do it just as easily uh, in processing. Uh, or you can mess around with color in Photoshop, for example. So standard picture, just adding a bunch of blue. You can see our skin tone change. Now it's starting to feel a little weird. So now I'm adding some green. And it feels, this feels more like the color grade that a, a film might have. But neutral, blue, meh adding in that green, making it feel like there's some intention to it. I kind of like that. You can try around in-camera crops. So there are people in photography who will insist that everything you do, every photo you make should be cropped in camera to be perfect. I don't believe that at all. I don't think there's anything wrong with cropping in post. All of these in-camera crops I'm about to show you, you could, you could absolutely do in post after you've taken the picture. I would always rather shoot a little wide and crop later than shoot too tight and wish that I'd shot wider. But if you're just playing around, cropping in camera is fun. Just adding some, a little bit of whimsy, I think, making this a little more fun. Not a whimsical expression, but still, I'm going to go with some whimsy. You know, play around with your cropping. Play around with your focus. So I think all of us have had that time where we photograph something and we've missed focus and we could kick ourselves because it's such a bummer. Um, with the newer technology, especially things like the Alpha 7 R5 with its AI assisted autofocus, which is incredible. It's very, 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 very rare that I miss focus now, unless I'm trying to handhold in a much too long shutter speed. Um, but we've all had those times where you focus on the wrong thing or it just misses for whatever reason. Sometimes missing focus on purpose can be cool. So Christmas tree lights, not interesting. Way out of focus, Christmas tree lights with all that bokeh and the glowing balls of color. I think that's fun. Christmas tree light, shallow depth of field, sure. In focus, it's just a not very interesting picture of a Christmas tree. Much more interesting. Getting in even tighter, still more interesting. Uh, if you're going to do that wide open, you can see, depending on the lens and the number of aperture blades you have, that you may have different shapes of out-of-focus bokeh balls. Uh, I actually kind of like that, too. There's even things, you know, bouquet of flowers, and then two out-of-focus. Out-of-focus, is this one in particularly interesting? Eh, too out of focus. Unless you're just looking for some abstract wallpaper, then maybe it's fine. Um, or this out of focus self-portrait I did as a silhouette that won, I don't know, an honorable mention or a third prize or something in the photo contest. Uh, but here, this picture, if I was in focus, not interesting at all. I don't have a version of it in focus. Uh, but out of focus... It's cool. It's evocative. You, you know, you can tell it's a person. Um, it's got some mood. It's got some interest. So play around with your focus. Not everything has to be sharp. Uh, I would encourage you if you're going to go not sharp to go very not sharp. Things that are a little bit out of focus feel 
like you just missed in my experience. Now, like I said before, you can do whatever you want. Maybe, you know, try different things and see. Maybe your picture that you want to try works best, just a little out of focus. I, you know, I can't say it's your picture. But my pictures and my experience, way out of focus is the answer. A little bit out of focus just feels like a mistake. You know, like if you have something that's a little crooked, it feels like a mistake. But if it's very crooked, well, clearly somebody did that on purpose, so it works better. Speaking of things crooked, uh, you know, play around with tilting the horizon, doing a Dutch tilt. So, you know, we all want to have everything correct in the viewfinder, right? But sometimes you can add some tension and some interest by tilting the angle. But like I said, I would encourage you to tilt it a lot, not just a little bit. Um, and just, you know, make it interesting. This feels almost like uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey to me that when the guy's walking around or the, maybe it was a woman, I don't remember, in the space station, is it spinning? A little bit of an angle can add some, just some interest. It makes things fun. Uh, think about placing things in front of the lens. So we have this portrait here. You can see how there's some very heavy vignetting on the left and on the right. All that is is me shooting very wide open and putting a couple of fingers in front of the lens. So those are my fingers that are, you're seeing causing the vignetting. You could do a similar thing here. You can see there's a little vignetting on the lower left, more heavy vignetting here. This is just a lens shade that's askew, so it's not on there correctly. And you start to see it. I'm sure we've all experienced this with a lens shade where it's just a little cockeyed and you're like, oh, now there's lens shade in my frame. But sometimes it can be cool. However, if you're going to do that, you want to be very wide open. If you're more stop down with a greater depth of field, then it's a harder edge like here. And that's not interesting. I think actually with these, I took the lens shade off and physically held it to get more of that vignetting. Um, so if you're going to experiment with that, I would encourage you shoot wide open because this and this more interesting than this. This just feels like there's something in the way. This one, same thing as before, uh, fingers in front of the lens. These are flowers in front of the lens, leaves in front of the lens. Sometimes if I'm somewhere where there's things have fallen to the ground, branches or leaves, I'll pick up a leaf and hold it in front. Don't break a leaf off of a tree unless it's your tree. Don't, if you're in a park or something. Don't break a leaf off of a tree or a branch off of a tree. But if it's on the ground, pick it up and see. Um, think about crop sensor lenses on full frame cameras. So I've certainly talked about it. Lots of people have talked about it. Crop sensor lenses are not built for full frame cameras. They typically will not cover the full image area. If you're shooting with a Sony camera, unless you turn it off, the camera will automatically crop to APS-C if you put an APS-C lens on. But in the menu, you can turn that off. You can change it from auto to off or on. Sometimes it makes it fun. Now this feels a little bit like a fisheye lens, even though it's just a lens uh, with an image circle that's not big enough, but it, it feels fun. This is a 1650, which is a little more square. You know, try around with that. See, maybe if, if you can put in micro four thirds lens on or who knows what find an old uh there were some 110 slrs i think which were little tiny uh it's a little tiny film cartridge i think that there were 110 slrs if there were and you can find one of those lenses maybe you can find an adapter and see uh you can experiment there's something called free lensing so free lensing is you take your lens take it off the camera and you hold it in front of the camera so that can do all sorts of things. Like here I am, you're seeing the edge of the lens at the lower left. You're seeing flare because light's getting in in the gap between the camera body and the lens itself. You're definitely going to get dust on your sensor. So be aware of that and make sure you have a blower or clean your sensor. But you can get this fun, flary, tilt shifty effect. This is much more tilt shifty. I find that it can work better with a longer lens 
And uh, some people really recommend if you're doing it, focus the lens to infinity before you take it off the camera, if it's an autofocus lens, um, because you're adding some distance. But it can be a fun effect. I encourage you to try it. You could also try tilt shift. So tilt shift is a lens that tilts and shifts. Uh, Sony doesn't make any tilt shift lenses. If you shoot something else, your manufacturer may or may not. However, this is a Minolta lens. Sony bought Minolta in the mid 2000s or their camera division with a tilt shift adapter. So it's a 35 millimeter film camera lens. I think it was a 50 or 55 uh, with a tilt shift adapter that I bought at B&H. And what that does, so this is not tilted or shifted. This is now tilted. It changes the relationship between the focus plane and the sensor plane so that they're no longer parallel and you get this effect where everything feels like a toy and things feel out of focus. <laughs> what people typically use it for is to actually make things in focus that are not parallel to the lens, to the film plane. I still call it the film plane, even though I haven't shot film in 15 years. Uh, the sensor plane. But you can do it for these fun effects here. The Empire State Building, the top is in focus. Everything else is dramatically out of focus. This is really far away. I'm not going to get this with any lens, even with a very, very shallow depth of field. It's just too far. <laughs> You're not going to get that out of focus effect with a standard lens. Maybe if you had a toy Empire State Building and you got really close to it. Or shifting the focus now, so focusing on more in the middle, now the spire is out of focus, focusing on the top of the buildings, all the cars are out of focus. It's a really fun thing and it's not that hard to do. You can pick up a used Minolta lens very inexpensively. The tilt shift adapter wasn't much, definitely uh, available on the B&H website. And it can be a very fun effect. It's one of the huge advantages of Sony mirrorless cameras and other mirrorless cameras as well, probably. I don't know the flange distance for other mirrorless cameras, but Sony mirrorless cameras, almost any lens ever made for a film camera will fit on a Sony mirrorless camera with the right adapter. <clears throat> and somebody's probably making that adapter. It's really, really a cool thing. It allows you to do stuff uh, that's just super fun. Uh, you can use flash with constant light. I've talked about this, I think, with some of my lighting classes. But if you use flash and either zoom the lens, which is what I did here, where you take a picture as you're taking the picture, you physically zoom the lens and you get this where the flash goes. It's relatively sharp, but everything else is moving and blurry. Very much so here and here. That's a very fun way to experiment. It's also very difficult to predict. Um, it works well in situations like this where there's a little bit of light, but not a ton. So here, this was me trying it outside, speed light on camera. You can see his face, you know, his eyes are show up and are fairly sharp. His hand is visible. Everything else is blurry. Uh, without the flash, everything is just a blurry mess. The flash throws enough that we can tell what's happening. It can make and add some interest. Uh, so whether it's on camera or off camera, this is off camera, on camera, you can do a lot by combining ambient light or constant light and flash and just moving, either zooming the camera, moving the camera. So this was zooming, physically zooming. This was rotating the camera. It can be a fun effect. These are in a much more controlled environment, constant source LED on our right, strobe on the left. So the LED is lighting the shadow side, the strobe isn't lighting the shadow side at all. That's why it's the shadow side and a black background so that there's no light coming through from the back and moving around and experimenting. These were all zooming. These are just having him move. So the subject is moving, the camera is static. Same thing here, camera is static, subject is moving during the exposure. So the flash freezes the part where it hits, the shadow side has the blur. All right, so another thing I really, really enjoy that is going to depend on the camera you have is pixel shift. So pixel shift is a feature. 
that the Alpha 7 R3, 4, 5, and the Alpha 1 all have, where it combines multiple images into one uh, with the 4, 5, and Alpha 1 larger image with the Alpha 7 R3. It's the same size image, but it's been debared with the larger ones. It's also debared, which is a digital sensor is a bare array where there's two green, I don't remember the order, but it's there's a red, a blue, and two green pixels, photosites in each square. And when you take a picture, each photosite is either red, green, or blue. And so everything's sort of interpolated from there. With pixel shift, it moves the sensor physically so that each photosite is exposed to everything. So each area gets two greens, a red and a blue, so you get more accurate color. And with the, like I said, with Alpha 7 R4 and 5, or 4A as well, and 5 and Alpha 1, you can also do a 16 shot pixel shift and get an image that's four times the size. So instead of 61 megapixels with the Alpha 7 R5 or 4, for example, you get a 240 megapixel image that's been debared. It's super cool. It's supposed to be for sharper, more color accurate images, but it doesn't have to be. I really like pixel shift as just a way to make things feel a little bit more abstract. So when you're doing pixel shift and setting it up, you typically lock your camera down. You don't want anything to move. Um, and in fact, with the newest versions of Sony's imaging edge, which is how you build the pixel shifts after you've shot them, there's a checkbox where if you check it, it will compensate for movement and, and deal with that because if you're photographing leaves, trees, for example, the leaves are going to be moving a little bit. Like unless you're in a very, very controlled environment, there's some movement. Clouds are moving, leaves are moving, you know, the grass is blowing in the wind. The newest version of Imaging Edge with Pixel Shift uh, helps compensate for that. And it, it does a very, very good job, but you can turn it off. And then do things like move the camera. So you have 16 shots where you've moved the camera between shots and you get something like this. Maybe a little too abstract. Trying it with portraits where my subject moved. This one I kind of liked. So far, this is to self-portrait. This was one of the COVID self-portraits. This is the one I've been happiest with. This is an example where you can't tell in camera because you have to process it to see. But black background, just moving repeatedly so that each of the 16 shots is not quite lined up. And you can do some really, really, really fun stuff with pixel shift. If you have one of those cameras, I really, really encourage you to try it. I, I really like it a lot. You've got the classic intentional camera movement or in-camera movement. The obvious thing, the thing that we've always done for years is panning. So we're moving the camera at the same speed as whatever you're photographing so that they are relatively sharp. You know, so the skateboarder, most of him is static. His leg that's kicking off is way blurry because it was moving. The street's blurry because it's moving and the camera's moving in time with him. Cab. So that's the standard thing that people have done forever. Panning. They do it with race cars a lot. Or you could zoom just like we did with the flash, but without flash, this is my nephew many years ago, zooming, long exposure on the streets of New York, long exposure upstate, long exposure, moving the camera in the direction of the trees to accentuate the verticality. Same thing again, panning with a bicycle from above, zooming with a tree, I actually quite like this. You see a question just popped in. You mentioned how some things work in movies, but may not work in still photography, yet a, a lot of the attempts you have shown, I find very cinematic and heavily inspired by movies. Your experimental work reminds me of David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. Curious to know if you do cinematic, cinematic photography, creating images as if they looked like they were framed straight out of a movie from an anonymous attendee. Um, thank you. That's, that's very nice to hear. Uh, it's nice for someone to say that my work feels like Mulholland Drive. David Lynch has some beautiful cinematography in his work. Um, I don't typically create stuff thinking of it as movie stills, but 
when it does feel like a movie still, it usually it makes me happy. Uh, I have some night work that somebody once told me it felt like Wong Kar Wai stuff. And I felt like that was a tremendous compliment. Um, you know, other people may disagree, but on um, whether or not it looks like his work. But I don't approach things as if they were movie stills, but I have been inspired by film. There, There's a thing in film that they do called Skip Bleach that I tried for years to figure out how to do with stills, where when they're processing the film, um, they skip the bleach process. So if you're shooting color film, it has silver just like black and white film does. And part of the processing is that they bleach out the silver and then they add in the, and then the dyes that are part of the film get brought in so that you see the color as well. But you can skip part of the bleach process and it changes the way the color film feels. Um, so there are movies that they use skip bleach for part of it. Minority Report, they did some skip bleach stuff. And I kept trying to get a lab to do it and they kept telling me they were and I never saw any difference. But um, so I have absolutely been inspired by film, but I don't approach things necessarily that way. Um, so zoom effect, uh, this is just mounting a camera on a car. If you're gonna do this, make sure you get the right stuff. b &H carries the suction cups that you can mount it. I like to use the Sony RX-02, which is a little one inch sensor camera that's very robust. So it's not heavy. So when it's on the suction cup, it, there's not a lot of weight. And if it does fall off, it's less likely to smash into a million pieces because it's designed to take a beating. Um, I'm a big fan of the RX-02. Long exposure, just the camera moving, car moving, car moving. Um, another thing, and again, I would recommend doing this with something like the RX-02. Um, is doing something where you physically throw the camera. So this is me with the RX-02, not like my Alpha 1 or my Alpha 7 or 5, throwing it in the air because if I drop it, it's probably not going to break. If you're going to th throw your camera in the air, be aware it could break. You could drop it. This may not be the experiment that everybody wants to try. Bear that in mind. It's your stuff. Don't break your stuff. You're, you know, we're all responsible for it. Um, I think we've all done some things where we're like, oh, that was a bad idea afterwards. So don't do that. Um, when I did this, it was RX-02. So if I did drop it, not the end of the world, I'm outside on a lawn. So it's not hard if it hits. Doing this with a big camera, you can do what you want. You're at least mostly grown-ups, I'm sure, but um, but it's a fun effect. So RX-02, tossing it in the air, same thing. Here I am catching it as it comes down. I don't think I ever actually had it hit the ground, but um, but you can get some fun effects just by doing things that aren't normal. Throwing your camera in the air, not normal. Um, intentionally just spinning the camera, so similar to what I did uh, earlier with the flash, but no flash. This is uh, a gentleman in Montepulciano in Tuscany who makes copper pots and pans. If you're ever there, you can go into his workshop, um, hopefully, and see him work. He was very, very nice. He visited New York once. He has a whole folder photo album. If you tell him you're from New York, he'll happily show it to you, I bet. Uh, there's pinhole cameras, a classic. Um, I think the easiest way to do a pinhole is buy a body cap, drill a hole in it, put some aluminum foil over it, and poke it with, with a sewing needle. If you do this, you're going to have to do some experimentation. So this I shot a few weeks ago when all that uh, wildfire smoke from Canada was down here. Hence that sort of apocalyptic uh, sky. Very out of focus. So pinhole works under the principle that if you stop down enough, things get sharper, right? If we stop down, our depth of field gets greater. If you squint your eyes, sometimes when you can't see so well, things get a little sharper. Pinhole works the same way. So body cap, 
pinhole, uh, a huge advantage of mirrorless cameras. Um, one of the great things that I love about my Sony's is if you're going to experiment with something like this, you can see. The very first time I did a pinhole on in a body cap was with a DSLR years ago. With a DSLR, when you look through the viewfinder, it doesn't. There's nothing there to make things brighter, and I couldn't see anything because the functional aperture of that pinhole is so small. It's very, 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 very dark. Your Sony mirrorless is going to make it brighter it, because it's able to do that. It just boosts the the exposure and you can see what you're doing and you can compose. So drilling a hole. Um, this is a bigger hole. Smaller hole. So medium hole, bigger hole, smaller hole. Bigger hole, way, 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 way too big. <laughs> this was punching the needle all the way through, sewing needle. This is punching the sewing needle all the way through and moving it a little to make it bigger. This was not punching it all the way through, just the, just the very point. This was much more successful. So be aware you may want to try have multiple pieces of aluminum foil and try some different needle sizes or uh, hole sizes and see. However, when I did this one, you can see I poked it through from the inside. And in doing, I didn't center it. So you can see the hole is off, way off to the side, right at the edge of the hole I drilled, the hole in the foil. So that big dark thing on the upper left that you're seeing is the body cap. So just, you know, think about that when you're poking your holes in. But you can see the smallest hole on the right, biggest hole in the middle, medium hole on the left, clearly sharper with the smaller hole. You do get diffraction as the hole gets smaller, which makes everything a little soft. It can. It was also especially an issue with older lenses. If you stop down to say 22 or 32, often your lens was not as sharp as 11 because of diffraction. It's definitely gonna be a case that you have with uh, pinholes. So medium, large, small. You can also try things like infrared. I have a Sony Alpha 6000 that I had converted to infrared by Precision Camera up in Connecticut. Um, so this is Florence, the classic bridge there, regular picture on the left, infrared and black and white on the right. Infrared, it's just fun and cool. I don't use it every day, but I think it's a fun camera. And there are things that I didn't know, uh, would show up that way at all. So when I was in Florence, I happened to be there the day of the Florence Marathon photographing some people in the marathon on the left. They look like marathon runners. When I did it with the infrared camera, because of the way that everybody's tech fabric, their exercise tech fabric reflects light, everybody looks like they're from Chariots of Fire where everybody's wearing white all the time. It was really an interesting effect. You can see this is the same spot, obviously not the same photo because I had to pick up one camera and put down the other camera. but. Um, the people on the right are basically wearing what the people on the left are wearing. It's just, it looks totally different because of that infrared, which I think is very, very cool. Similar. And then infrared portrait. And then, of course, yeah, you can try around and experiment with software. So I mentioned a lot of the early stuff, like cross-processing. You could basically duplicate with software now with Photoshop. Um, I was experimenting for a while trying to intentionally corrupt images. Uh, I'm sure some of you have had photos where something just went weird, you know, something got corrupted in the file and now part of it looks strange. Um, I was trying to figure out how to do that intentionally. And so far I have yet to experiment in a way where I could see it. I've done things where, so you can open, uh, JPEG, for example, in a hex editor and just randomly change some of the uh, the code. I've tried that. What I found is either I can't see any difference at all or I change so much that it doesn't even open anymore. So I don't know where the middle ground is. I haven't found it yet. But while trying to do that, I found this website called Photomosh. I have no relationship to them uh, that basically makes it look like it was corrupted, which I thought was cool. 
Uh, you can also do Photoshop. So that picture we have played around with the color before, now it starts to feel like it's solarized. Uh, solarization is something with film where if you were making a print, for example, you would expose your paper, put it in the developer. Before you put it in the stop bath, you'd flash the darkroom lights. If you were in a darkroom by yourself, obviously you couldn't do that if it was a group darkroom. Just quickly flash them on and off so it got a ton of light really fast, really quick. Drop it in and you'd get weird effects where sometimes highlights and shadows would reverse. And this feels like solarization. The way you do that, or the way I do it, just open a curves layer, go to curves, really, really, really mess with that uh, shadow side in particular. So you can put down a little placeholder like I did on the uh, in the highlight side there, that little dot to just hold that in place and then just yank the shadow side up. I think it looks cool. It feels like a negative. There's also something, a lot of people do this with uh, infrared where you swap channels. So uh, if you want to try that in Photoshop, I use it as a layer, go to new adjustment layer, channel mixer. You don't have to do it as a layer. You can just go to channel mixer. Take your, uh, go to your red channel, make your red zero. So it's already zero here on the right uh, and make your blue 100 with the input channel as red. Then go to your blue input channel in the drop, dar, drop down, make your blue zero, your red 100. And now he looks like Nightcrawler from x -Men. This is playing around some more with the green, 200 green, 100 green. So here I've swapped the red and the green. Here I've swapped the red and the blue. Typically people swap red and blue. Um, I have had the most success swapping red and blue, but do whatever you want. You know, you're you, try things out. Just because everybody else does something one way doesn't mean that it won't look awesome if you try something else. All right, let's see if there are any questions. I went through a bunch. Derek's coming back on. I'm coming back on and we'll see if we have any questions. I was just thinking about it and I'm like, anything goes when you're experimenting. So what yes. people ask? Somebody prove me wrong. I don't know what you can possibly ask. If, uh, everything's on the table here, I guess. I everything mean, I, I guess there are things that you know will end up with just no image at all. Yeah. But, you know, if I take the lens off my camera and point it at the sun, it's just going to be white. Like, in, yeah. in this day and age, that could be sold for millions and considered art, though, right? Yeah, I saw there's a famous, there was a famous photographer, I don't know if he's still famous, called Andre Serrano, who had a picture that was of milk. It was a white picture of milk. And I saw him speak, and he said his printer had a hard time printing it and asked, why can't I just not expose the paper? It looks the same. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, no, you have to print it. I guess there's a fine line between you get into like intention, you know, the intentional, you're trying to create something or then you get deep into saying something about art in and of itself. And I, I don't know. I guess at a certain point you get into the weeds and it circles back around. There was a French uh, artist named Yves Klein. He did a lot of monochrome paintings with Klein blue. MoMA has some. They're actually quite beautiful. And in person, you can see the texture and stuff. But he, at one point, invited the press to a gallery opening. And when they got there, there was nothing on the walls. And he said it was because it was charged with his artistic presence. I'm in the wrong field, Tony. I, I think I need to move more, less from the tech side over towards the art side where anything goes. Well, there was only one Eve Klein. I don't know. <laughs> Well, now, now I kind of want to see what I can do. I mean, I've experimented with, I, I guess you have your your more mainstream side of experimentation. You know, a lot of the stuff that you went over with playing with, uh, you're playing with everything we know, the technical bounds of photography. Yeah. And you're getting an image that is, I, I guess, more seen along the mainstream as acceptable and it's creative. I, I think I'm going to challenge myself to go really off into the the weeds and see what I can come up with. You should. I want to see what you come up with. I want I mean, to see too. I don't. I don't have any ideas, but there are people gonna, that are going to have ideas that never in a million years would have occurred to me that are going to be awesome. 
Yeah. And, and look, it's God. it's art. It's subjective, right? It's yeah. everybody has their own their own voice, their own vision. There's and I think of all the great things that have been discovered by accident or by people breaking quote unquote rules. So I, I'm throwing out the challenge to everybody. If you're watching right now, if you're listening right now, it doesn't take a lot of time. S- sit on it, marinate on it. Take some, take a little bit of time and try to create something that you wouldn't normally show. It's all anonymous. When we critique these, it's anonymous. No one's going to know it's you. Unless you put your watermark on it. Unless you put your watermark on it. But if there's no watermark, there's no face, no case. Mm-hmm. Tony will critique it. And uh, look, it's I, I think it's it's more fun to strip away all the rules and and the having to worry about if something's going to be seen as a nice picture or not. I think you can have more fun with it. You can get way more creative. We'll see. I'm kind of excited. We are we did actually already have two submissions I saw come in. Oh, great. During your presentation. So let's keep look, that going. I look forward everybody. to seeing them. Yes, I look forward to seeing them as well and then and creating myself. So looks like that's all we got for now. Tony, all a, right. a huge thank you to you. And we'll see you next time for some critiques. Hopefully you guys do get involved and hopefully you have some fun with it. But uh, that's all we have uh, in the bag oh, for now. Wait, I just saw something pop up. Yep. Is it okay to use Photoshop beta generative film? I can't tell anybody what to do or not to do. <laughs> to me, that's... I wouldn't encourage that in this instance because it's not its not something that there's a lot of control over. The Photoshop generative fill beta, for those who don't know, is in Photoshop if you're running the beta, um, although I believe you can't use it commercially yet. You could, for example, have a picture of New York City and you know draw a lasso around a section and tell it to fill it with a forest. And it really does an incredible job but all of a sudden now there's a forest in new york city um i feel like that's less experimentation but bobby i you know you i can't tell you what experimentation is to you so to me it's a different kind of experimentation if to you that is experimentation that uh you want to try and you feel like that's something you want to submit submit it you know i started down the path of saying i don't know i don't know that it counts and now i've decided that you know experimentation is i don't want to tell other people what experimentation is because then it's what i think experimentation is and the whole point is to make it as wide as possible and give people as many as much rope to experiment and try and see what they like as possible so do whatever you want that's that's now my answer there we go. It's it's such a uh, an oh, interesting and, world we're moving. Into. Oh, and she and Bobby also said, but we do something similar using layers in our own photos. Um, well, I already said do whatever you want, but uh, that is true. We do something similar using layers in our own photos, but that's something that we we do with more intention. Um, but I'm standing by. Do whatever you want. Um, if that's the experimentation you want to try, go for it. I I don't especially with their experimentation, I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to tell anybody, well, I'm going to tell you my opinion on whatever pictures are submitted, but um, I'm not going to tell you what experimentation is acceptable and unacceptable. If it's experimentation and you want to try it, then it's fine. There we go. Well, you guys have it there. Throw us whatever you can come up with. As long as it's creative, as long as you're experimenting, Tony will have an opinion on it. There we go. Well, Tony, huge thank you to you, as always, for joining us. We'll see you next time for some critiques. Thank you to Sony for hosting this wonderful series and all of our viewers out there for tuning in. That is it. Another rendition of the BNH virtual event space is in the books. We'll catch you all next time. Thanks, everybody.